Welcome, Professor Hillman. We are glad to have you here to speak with us on BRI and the new independent task force report you directed and authored alongside David Sachs. At the Council on Foreign Relations uh, Greenberg Center for Geoeconomic Studies, Professor Hillman specializes in international trade law and the World Trade Organization, US trade policy and breaks. Professor Hillman has served as a member of the World Trade Organization's appellate body, a key component of the WTO's dispute settlement system. She served as ambassador, chief textiles negotiator, and general counsel at the Office of the United States Trade Representative, president of, trade for, of the Trade Foreign Policy Forum, uh, and senior transatlantic fellow for the German Marshall Fund of the United States. In her role as USTR ambassador and chief textiles negotiator, Professor Hillman negotiated bilateral agreements with over 45 countries. Alongside her long track record in public service, Professor Hillman teaches international business and trade as a professor of practice at the Georgetown University Law Center and serves as a fellow of, the Georgetown, of Georgetown's Institute of International Economic Law. Professor Hillman is an alumna of both Duke and Harvard University and sits on the board of visitors at Duke University's Sanford School of Public Policy. Professor, thank you for joining us tonight. Well, thank you. It is really an honor and a pleasure to be here. And, and I really want to thank um, Evan for putting this, uh, this whole program together. And just as a little plug here, um, the reason I got to know Evan was he served as an absolutely superb uh, intern uh, with me at the Council on Foreign Relations. And so I only say that to say uh, for all of you that are out there that are interested in this issue of the nexus between economic policy and foreign policy, I hope you will keep the Council on Foreign Relations in mind. Uh, we do run an internship program fall, spring, and summer. Uh, and so for those of you that might be interested, we would encourage you to think about uh, serving as an intern um, at the Council on Foreign Relations. Just go to CFR.org and, and, and you know, put in that word intern and, and see if uh, that might be a, a good fit for those of you that are interested. I, I am really delighted and honored to be here tonight uh, because this is, if you will, the China moment. Uh, if you think about uh, what happened with the fairly frosty, I would say, exchange between uh, the income Biden administration and its new Secretary of State and Secretary and uh, National Security Advisor in Anchorage, uh, where it was again, I think, a, a, a very difficult conversation uh, building on uh, a growing level of bipartisan concern in the Congress and throughout the country with where we're headed in terms of our relationship with China. This this evening um, and the and what we're going to talk about, I think, comes comes at a very important moment um, in this relationship. Um, you know, and what I was part of and was very proud to be part of it was this effort at the Council on Foreign Relations to do an independent task force report that really examined top to bottom China's Belt and Road Initiative, uh, and and more importantly, sort of how it's changed over time, and most importantly, what should the United States do uh, to respond to what we found as we sort of peeled back the onion slowly, slowly to try to get at the heart of what is BRI. So again, I'm, I'm delighted to be here tonight to have a conversation about it. Thank you for that introduction. So before we get into individual questions, I want to uh, set the stage a little bit in terms of where we are with uh, BRI. So the Belt and Road Initiative was announced in 2013 uh, during a visit to Kazakhstan by President Xi Jinping. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is a global infrastructure development scheme that has become a crown jewel of China's foreign policy. So, so much so that in 2017, BRI was integrated into China's constitution. Estimates of its size may vary, but Morgan Stanley predicts that its total expenses could reach as high as $1.3 trillion by 2027. And as you mentioned, Jennifer, there is a lot with regards to recent developments within BRI that have kind of changed conditions. Uh, so an example of this is what China faces at home, which is stagnating growth and substantial risk in its corporate debt sector. Abroad, BRI projects often lack proper feasibility assessments and have faced cost issues and sizable demand shortage. And obviously the, these uh, problems were further exacerbated uh, by the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. And as a result, uh, China's policy bank lending uh, has declined significantly from a high of 75 billion in 2016 to just $4 billion last year. 
So it, it's within this context uh, that the independent task force report uh, was written. Uh, it was chaired by former Treasury Secretary Jacob Blue and retired Admiral Gary Roughhead. Uh, but to begin, you, provide a, you provided a great introduction there. Uh, but I, I think uh, some students at GW and people outside would be interested in hearing a little bit more about uh, the initiative and how it first came about. What was the real purpose behind it? Yeah, so it's very interesting because a lot of people today would say this has all along been sort of a Trojan horse that is some have described it, that it is to get China uh, ability to sort of in, in, in essence create a Sinocentric world in which it is sending out in the form of all of these infrastructure projects as part of a grand scheme uh, to make everything and everyone sort of run through through Beijing. I think the task force did not really accept that that really was what, at least what started it. Uh, it's very clear, I think, when you look at it, that this was started first and foremost because China has a real problem in that it has a highly developed East Coast, uh, and then the interior Western parts of China are still fairly rural and undeveloped. So an awful lot of it started out as a way to, again, create transportation hubs, roadways and railways running from Eastern China into Western China, and then from Western China on, uh, on eastward into, into Russia and on into Europe or further south down into uh, the Middle East and, and again up through North Africa. So it started very much as a way to integrate uh, internally uh, within China. It also clearly started because as China's state-owned enterprises became bigger and bigger and started just producing more of everything, more steel, more aluminum, more all of these things, uh, it was clear that China needed to find other markets. It had overcapacity, overproduction in an awful lot of basic materials and chemicals, like I said, steel and aluminum. So BRI became a very good outlet for a lot of that excess production. Um, BRI also um, was done in part uh, to put a lot of China's accumulated savings to work. I mean, China, again, has been running these major trade surpluses with the rest of the world, exporting more than it's importing. So it had a lot of accumulated savings and the perception was this was a good way to put it to work. And other things that were part of this, again, were that China wanted uh, to secure access to certain raw materials that it needed. So you'll see a lot of the BRI projects are in order to make sure that China is gonna have access to minerals and other components that it needs for itself. And most importantly, perhaps for access to energy, oil and coal and, uh, and liquid natural gas, much of which has to run through the Straits of Malacca to get there. So it's wanting to make sure that it can protect its ability to come through those straits. So again, a lot of the initial demand was basically intra-China um, and at its core, uh, again, for the Chinese Communist Party to maintain control is the number one goal within China. Uh, number one, number two, number three goal, make sure the Communist Party stays in control. And part of that is making sure you continue to have economic growth. And part of continuing to have economic growth was again, to do this kind of an initiative uh, that allowed the economic growth to be maintained within China. So an awful lot of the initial impetus was much more about economic policy and about intra-Chinese domestic policy than it was a grand scheme to, if you will, exert geopolitical influence throughout the world. Thank you for that. That was a, a great summary of uh, how BRI developed over time and how it was initially created. Uh, but where do you see this initiative as being now uh, with all of the conditions that I, that I mentioned earlier? Uh, what has this development led to? So again, BRI has changed and changed remarkably from where it started in 2013. Part of the remarkable change is the increase in the geographic reach of it. Again, remember it was started out to sort of replicate the ancient maritime roads and the ancient silk roads, which again, largely went from China through over to Europe. Now BRI encompasses 139 countries. The vast majority of Sub-Saharan African countries are part of it. A significant number of Latin American and Caribbean countries are part of it. All of the ASEAN countries and, and the Asian countries. Uh, so it's massively increased in terms of its geographical region. But more importantly is it's you know, significantly increased in its scope. So again, it started out as a connectivity measure which was largely focused around roads, bridges, 
railroads and ports, you know, again, the movement of goods and people. Um, over time, and specifically after the, the strike of COVID, the shift has been major to becoming a, largely a digital, um, a digital project. So it is now all about telecommunications. Again, this installation of 5G and the sort of promotion of Huawei and ZTE, it is about creating smart grids and smart cities and uh, promoting the use of digital health care that China is sending out into the world. It is a huge expansion into financial technology, fintech in the form of electronic payment systems and the development of a whole entire blockchain network system. And, and it has basically gone digital. Um, and that is on the one hand, you know, a lot of what countries need, it is far less expensive to do digital projects than it is to build a road or a railroad. So it allows China to do a lot more, a lot farther, a lot faster if it is focused on the digital. But again, you have to remember from a security perspective, it has a downside. Um, it is giving China surveillance capabilities that it would never have gotten just from building a port or a road. Um, again, with you think about where the fintech technology is headed, particularly if China, for example, does develop its, its, uh, its digital currency and everything runs through its electronic payment systems, that means the Communist Party has real time access to every single transaction committed by every single person in China or doing business with China. So the level of sort of data gathering, surveillance, uh, and, and that kind of risk has gone way up as China, as the BRI has, has moved into becoming much more of a digital enterprise. I, I would like to follow up on, on one of the aspects of that, uh, which there have been a few developments with recently. You mentioned fintech as a large part of the digital Silk Road. Uh, recently, we've seen a large crackdown in fintech firms, uh, which have been associated with Ant uh, and uh, that whole aspect of the Chinese uh, finance industry. And it seems like this is expanding uh, largely to other fintech private firms, uh, which the bulk of uh, fintech firms are, uh, are private. Uh, so I was wondering there, if you saw, if you if you could see any uh, potential change in circumstances in terms of its place in the digital Silk Road, and generally what the kind of outlook is on fintech. So uh, again, it's a it's a really good question because fintech is one of the areas that is on the one hand related to BRI and on the other hand not. Uh, because when you step back from it and look at what, what is it that you can say is characterizing BRI, uh, first of all, a huge portion of the BRI projects are funded by two policy banks um, in China. Um, and it is those policy state-owned, state-controlled banks that are really have been by and large the drivers of BRI. That is not the driver in fintech. So you are correct. Uh, and, and the big difference here is, again, when you when you step back and look at BRI, you know, from all of these projects, and you look at, you know, sort of who's doing all of this work. China said when it opened up BRI that BRI was going to be available to, in essence, all all comers, that everybody could participate in BRI. What we've seen is that 90% of all the contracts are won by Chinese companies. And the answer to why is that um, is part of the whole story of BRI. Why do Chinese companies win all these contracts? In part, it's because they get this, uh, this very much state-owned, state-controlled, state-sponsored financing through these, through these banks. Partly it is because the companies themselves are trying to curry favor with Xi Jinping because they know that he is a big promoter of, of BRI. Partly it's because the many of the companies themselves are largely or wholly state-owned companies. And they've gotten to be the biggest, you know, largest, most expansive co country companies um, in the world, largely on the backs of Chinese subsidies, Chinese support, um, and, and a whole sort of model of, of development. FinTech is a bit different because, again, as you say, the biggest companies are not 100% state-owned companies. They are Ant or what maybe people would know of as Alibaba or Alipay or Ali something. Again, Jack Ma. Uh, so again, it is much more in that private sector category. Tencent, the same thing. That's WeChat, um, WePay, WeChat Pay, and all of those providers are, 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 again, more in the private sector. 
However, they have been sort of, if you will, piggybacking on BRI by trying, again, heavily starting to do a lot of their investments in BRI countries um, and are trying to sort of get credit for being a part of or supportive of or connected to BRI on the theory that if you are considered a BRI project, the perception is that you will continue to have long-term support from the Chinese government, uh, from the Communist Party, because this is, again, Xi Jinping's signature, signature endeavor. So they're, they're trying, on the one hand, to remain private and separate from you know, direct control from the Communist Party, and on the other hand, trying to get, if you will, the benefits of being associated with BRI. But it's very clear that among the biggest sort of fintech expansions uh, outside of China, particularly with respect to electronic payments. And that's where China is way, way, way ahead of the rest of the world. I mean, in terms of the number of people that use an electronic payment app uh, on their phone or you know, however they use it, uh, you know, again, connected to Alipay and WeChat is just far outside. I mean, you know, tenfold larger than than you know PayPal or any sort of U.S. or other competitors to it. Um, and and again, the the good and the bad of that is it is giving again China to the extent that they can force Ali, uh, you know, Ant or 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 uh, or Tencent. This is the big rub, is whether or not they are in some way required or could be required to turn over information or data to the government of China. And it is that exact tension of whether China could order Ant to turn over all of this data or Tencent to turn over all this data is part of the reason why you are seeing the fight that you are seeing right now. Ant was supposed to do a major um, public offering in terms of raising raising money, and it ultimately was shut down effectively because of this fight between who's going to control what and and the, and the government of China in essence shut that down. So that is an area of on the one hand linking to BRI and on the other hand trying to stay very much outside of the complete purview of, of the Chinese government. Right, and I think, uh, so launching off of that, you mentioned uh, the policy bank's involvement. Uh, and, and I was wondering more uh, specifically, I, I mentioned earlier that there was this drawdown in funding from uh, BRI policy banks. Uh, and so I, I wanted to ask you what the main reasons are for this drawdown in lending and also what the potential impact is on the Chinese economy, given the substantial non-performing loan portfolio that uh, BRI projects uh, are consisting of. Right. And a lot of the reason for the cutback, I think, is two or threefold. One is I think you are starting to see a lot of requirements for debt renegotiations. In other words, a lot of the lending that was done early on you know, was for these big port and railroad and road projects that are simply not economically performing. Uh, they're not gonna be, you know, again, you, you've seen China build a huge number of ports um, around the world, uh, particularly in, in Asia, South Asia, and, and, and Sub-Saharan Africa. There aren't enough boats coming to call at those ports to generate enough port fees, to generate enough revenue to pay back those loans. So you're starting to see increasing numbers of loans, as you say, go into default. Uh, and when the country involved um, is a least developed country with very little reserves, um, they simply cannot find the money to continue to pay back these loans. So they are seeking debt negotiations, renegotiations with China. What we're finding is that this has been very difficult because by and large, China is reluctant to write off those loans. That's not what it's doing. It's not canceling a lot of the debt. Instead, it is simply extending out the terms for much longer periods of time, uh, which again, which helps to some degree for these countries, but it isn't dealing with the underlying problem. So I think some of the cutbacks are the fact that the banks are realizing uh, that if they're not, they're gonna be pressured, if they keep lending at the, way they, at the rates and ways in which they've been lending before, they're gonna be even more demands for debt renegotiation. They are starting to get a lot of external pressure from the United States and other countries, you know, to put pressure on China to say, no, you have to do better in these debt negotiations. Um, and the other part of it is, again, this shift to digital. It's just a lot less expensive to install a 5G network than it is to install a port or a high-speed railroad line. So some of it is the projects themselves have a lesser price tag on them than, than the old projects used to. But the majority, I think, of the reason why you're seeing the cutback is, uh, is there are not 
very many economically viable infrastructure projects out there in the world that have not already sort of been started or done or where there is a realistic prospect for uh, an immediate payback of all of the money that's being lent in order to do that project. So the banks themselves are starting to do some of this cutting back and how much lending they're doing. Right, and so that leads into my next question, which surrounds uh, the potential for a debt crisis. So uh, one key event uh, that the task force report describes is the S&P's downgraded uh, credit outlook uh, on at least 15 BRI countries. Uh, so my question is, are you concerned about the funding uh, gap brought on by uh, yeah. the BRI's lending drawdown uh, in triggering uh, you know, further decays in emerging market uh, fiscal positions? And overall, how could this impact the global recovery and US uh, firms market position? So the answer is, are we worried? Yes. I think everyone on the task force is extremely worried about it. And you are starting to see, you know, other institutions, you know, the IMF and the World Bank and others really focus on what this could mean. Uh, and, and you look at a country, if you if you pick, for example, Pakistan, this is the single, this is the signature country for BRI. I mean, this is where Xi Jinping really wanted to make a difference in turning around uh, the Pakistani economy in terms of great creating all of these connections with, again, a neighbor, a neighboring country for a whole host of reasons. Pakistan was chosen for the biggest, most most significant number of BRI projects. They're in serious trouble. I mean, project after project after project is simply not going to be economically sustainable. And as a result, Pakistan has now had to go back to, to the IMF to try to figure out whether or not there is you know, sort of financing available. And, and that is the concern that it's not just Pakistan, it's a number of these other countries where you know, other forms of assistance packages are going to have to be worked out. Uh, and again, that, that puts the difficult position of, of the IMF and the World Bank, in essence, funding BRI um, on the back end, which again is, is not desirable from anybody's terms, particularly because we're finding, you know, again, as we start to find out, a study literally just came out today, um, looking at trying to get into the details of a hundred of these loans that are to these BRI countries. And the, you know, and again, some of the biggest things that you find out is that they are completely uh, not transparent. Uh, you cannot find out anything, and most of them have very draconian non-disclosure clauses in them. So again, the government of Pakistan is not going to be allowed to go to the IMF and say, here's my loan terms. This is what I've had to accept from China. You have to help me because in theory, they're not even allowed to disclose the basic terms of the loan. So a huge concern that yes, this is going to create, and again, you have to remember these are among, these loans are among two countries that were already in significant debt distress before COVID, uh, which are now in a much worse financial position um, in, you know, post pandemic, uh, and who have the least ability to deal with COVID and then the least ability to try to figure out how to pay back these huge loans to China. So the concern is yes, and then it creates a drag on economic growth more generally. It makes it harder for the World Bank to come up with money to present as an alternative so that the World Bank starts financing these infrastructure projects instead of China, because if and when the World Bank can do that, the World Bank will not provide commercial loans, it will provide grants. So again, it will provide funds on a much better basis for these countries. If the World Bank does the projects, they actually have an environmental impact assessment in advance. If the World Bank does the project, it is done, you know, again, in a high standards way. If the World Bank does the project, it tends to involve local labor, a skill transfer to local labor, training of local labor, a lot of things that are not happening if it's China um, and its BRI program that is doing this this construction or this lending. So, you know, again, a whole lot of reasons for why it is not good for the world uh, if all of these countries start to go into some form of default um, on either individual loans, individual projects, or, or from a more macroeconomic level, it will be a big drag on economic growth just when we need, you know, the world to try to be growing in order to grow our way back to where we were pre-pandemic. To follow up on that, you mentioned uh, the opaque lending practices that, that China has been utilizing when it comes to uh, least developed countries. So what I was wondering was, 
what can the U.S. do to attempt to improve the situation? How can they bring China into the fold when it comes to sharing uh, loan information, sharing data? And what can the U.S. incentivize China to do in this instance? So again, what, what clearly the task force is, is recommending is that this has got to be at the top of the agenda for how does the United States respond uh, to Belt and Road. And it has to be a multi-pronged effort. I mean, and first and foremost, the view is on this one, you need to work with your allies. You need to get all of the other allies together in order to put pressure on China. And pressure to do what? I mean, pressure in part is to release the terms of these loans so that the rest of the world can see them. Part of the pressure is to encourage China to join the Paris Club. You know, this is this group of countries that gets together when there are these macroeconomic debt problems to try to, in essence, collectively renegotiate them or collectively come together to figure out what's the right package to put together for, for providing debt relief. Uh, and so again, a strong encouragement to figure out whether you can put pressure on China um, to, to join the, the Paris Club. Uh, again, increased pressure to, to encourage China to, uh, to, in essence, sign on to a lot of the international lending conventions, things like do an environmental impact assessment before you do the loan. Part of it is also a real effort to make sure that one country can find out, in essence, what's going on so that they have an ability to figure out, am I getting a good deal or not? Because this is clearly one of the things that's happened is that China is trying to do all of these super secret, don't tell anybody what's in there and do all of the negotiations as a one-off contract uh, so that nobody that's part of this has the ability to look somewhere else and say, how much did you pay for a coal-fired power plant? How much did you pay per mile for a railroad? How much did you pay? There is none of that comparative going on. You know, we, we cite in, in, in this report in, in Myanmar, um, the United States was able to send in a technical team with some diplomats, some engineers, um, and some lawyers from, you know, again, a collective U.S. government agency to try to help Myanmar before it signed on the dotted line to a deal with China and was able to bring down the, the cost of a port from $7.3 billion to $1.7 billion. I mean, that's how much inflated uh, the initial sort of deal was going to be. So part of it is also to try to figure out a way to create a better information sharing network. Uh, and again, the United States is among those that are going to try to lead this effort to say, you know, you simply have got to join the international conventions that allow disclosure of lending terms. You've got to become a part of the, um, uh, the Paris Club. And then there is a larger debt sustainability initiative that is run, again, through the multilateral development banks. You know, and so it is making sure that China does not continue to take the position that uh, particularly its Exim Bank is not subject to the disciplines of this debt re restructuring initiative. Right. And to follow up there, you made some interesting points uh, surrounding a few of the things that the U.S. needs to look towards. Uh, so now I want to move on to another point of this uh, question, which is how can America respond? So the first part of this uh, that I want to address is, does the U.S. actually have the capacity to respond? Uh, does it, will it have the ability to fill in this funding gap that has been left by the BRI and move the U.S. to a more competitive position? So again, the, what, the, what the task force recommends is that in order to respond, the United States is going to have to do a whole series of things. But it starts with what it has to do at home, because you're exactly right. Uh, I mean, the basic bottom line here is this notion of you can't fight um, something with nothing. Uh, and in too many of the areas, the concern is that the United States has nothing or close to nothing to offer. I mean, we cannot continue to go around the world and tell everyone that they cannot use Huawei for their 5G when we do not have 5G to offer. We cannot be constantly telling countries, no, you cannot use Chinese BRI for high-speed rail. We don't have any high-speed rail to offer as an alternative. So part of it is um, in those areas where we do think it is absolutely essential that there be kind of a U.S. presence, that there be engagement um, from the United States, that we form coalitions with those that do. So fine, we don't have 5G right now. We, that, what does that mean we need to do? We need to do a couple of things. One is uh, a perception that we need to start partnering with Nokia and Ericsson and, and Samsung that do have 5G. 
We have to create a kind of partnership and a coalition. We have to allow our development finance corporation to potentially fund some of that cooperation. We have to make sure that US companies get in on some of the rest of it in the cloud end. Uh, again, there's a big effort now to try to go to what is referred to as open RAN, uh, open networks, so that you have more kind of plug and play components in the system so that you don't are not wedded to entirely Chinese technology throughout the entire span of, of, of a network. Uh, again, making sure that there is places where US technology can be plugged in, where there is a more open uh, open network, but that is gonna have to mean working with those that already do for a starter. The whole second aspect of it though is fine. Okay, we've lost the 5G race. What about 6G? What about artificial intelligence? What about all of the next generation technologies? What about clean energy? What about all of the entire panoply of advanced technologies? And there, you know, the argument is in order to be able to offer a legitimate alternative to China, we have got to be more competitive in those areas. And that is going to take significant investments. Uh, again, I, I think I, I, I tried to read very carefully what uh, President Biden said today about this next uh, package that they're unveiling because there's an awful lot of overlap here to say, we need to be putting more money, more resources, and more emphasis into, um, I don't want to call it a digital Marshall Plan, but I mean the idea of a full on all of government, all of private sector, all of the United States effort to make sure that we're going to continue to lead um, in these key technology areas um, by investing in research and development, by investing in STEM education across all levels, um, by, again, supporting U.S. companies, by upping the level of our commercial diplomacy so our companies get a fairer shake, by promoting, again, packages of, of, of things to offer that will have significant U.S. components in them. All of that is going to have to be done if we're going to, if we're going to you know, continue to you know, be able to say to these countries, uh, you can look at a U.S. alternative to China in these areas, and here's what we have to offer, and that offer has to be a good competitive offer. So what does this look like from the standpoint of the federal government? Uh, there are a lot of different tools that the U.S. has at its disposal. Does this look like any specific changes to uh, the DFC, uh, the Development Finance Corporation, or uh, cross-agency collaboration? What does this look like from that standpoint? So there's a whole number of areas in which the task force is basically suggesting that the government needs to up its game uh, or potentially even change its game. Just a couple of things, just for example. One of the things that the task force is making very clear is a problem is in the technical area of standards. You know, So again, across a whole series of products, there are very technical standards. Again, much more in the tech area, and I'm not gonna be able to explain them exactly, but let's just, as an easy example, you know, what's the standard for the length of cord on a refrigerator? You know, and if China says it's a meter and our country and our companies make it one yard in length, then all of a sudden you can't easily trade or companies have to know where am I sending this refrigerator before I put the cord on, et cetera. So you get to all these issues. And when you get into technology, obviously the standards are really, really important. And if the standards are written in a way that totally favors Chinese product and they're written in a way that US companies just don't make to that standard normally. Could they? Yes, but it's very expensive to make to two or three different standards. So it's much better if you, you can make to a single standard and if that single standard is one that we use. Well, China has sort of taken over the standard setting organizations. Uh, you know, again, Chinese nationals are at the highest levels of the international, the ITU, which is the main standard setting organization in the tech area. China is submitting, you know, 10, 15, 20,000 proposals for the standards around 5G. We submit maybe a thousand. You know, and part of that is that we have not done what the government needs to do, which is to be a consistent presence at all of those standard setting organizations to make sure we're doing across our entire government, which has lots of government agencies that play in the standards area, to make sure they're all talking to each other and that we're really aggressively presenting a U.S. position, that we host more standard setting meetings on our side of the border. So in just the one little area of standards, it's a lot of sort of do better, do more, do more coordination, but most importantly, make it a priority that we end up, you know, at the leadership of standards. You talk about DFC again. So the answer is yes. 
The issue there is, you know, that DFC has to get more engaged in helping the likely successful companies that are trying to compete in the BRI area. And, and you see this all the time where, you know, you know, companies go in and they say, we could offer you, we could offer you whichever country it is, you know, we could offer you at least comparable, if not better technology, but ours would be done, you know, in a more environmentally friendly way. We will train your workforce, China won't, you know, et cetera, all these reasons why ours is a better product. And the response comes back, yes, but China is offering us, in essence, financing. That means that we don't have to pay anything for 15 years. Can you match that? And the U.S. company's response is always, no, we can't match that. So the question is, how much and how far can DFC go to allow the U.S. companies to at least offer, not comparable, again, nobody is suggesting that we can dollar for dollar match China, but at least offer enough to be in the ball game, um, uh, where then all of a sudden the other things that the U.S. companies put on the table, like training, like environmental quality, like economically sustainable projects, those start to now weigh more. And as between the two, there's a better chance that the U.S. comes out on the winning end. So on the multilateral side of, of this response, recently there has been a lot of discussion around special drawing rights, which is uh, essentially uh, going to provide some form of debt relief for uh, individual least developed countries uh, that ha that have the need for it. Uh, in the IMF, uh, Janet Yellen has has recently introduced this as a possible idea for handling the ongoing debt crisis. Uh, so, looking at it from the perspective of BRI and also the potential for those SDR allocations to be abused and used to pay back uh, Chinese loans, uh, way, what position should the U.S. take on this individual component of the multilateral response? Well, again, the, the general response, I think, from, from the task force writ large is that we should be doing all that we can to shore up the multilateral institutions, provide them with more resources. So again, if, if special drawing rights is the best way or the most efficient way to provide them with more resources, do that. You know, If it is an upping of the capital levels that everybody contributes into the World Bank, do that. But the general notion is we are simply going to have to both you know, create more resources and more support and much more priority so that the World Bank is the one that is getting back into the game of building basic infrastructure and that the IMF is getting seriously back in the game of helping these countries not get into one of these debt spirals that just takes them down and down and, and, and takes a lot of the economic growth out of these economies. So uh, again, the general sense is we simply have to uh, provide greater support, uh, both financial support and, you know, again, policy support for the multilateral institutions to be offering a genuine but high standards. You know, again, high standards in terms of transparency, high standards in terms of environmental quality, high standards in terms of economic stability, high standards alternatives to China and help countries understand the difference. Because a lot of the reason why China's BRI was, why was it so successful? Why did 139 countries sign on to it? Why are there so many projects, many of which are not economically viable? Why? It's clearly because China was filling a void. At some level, the World Bank stepped away from doing basic infrastructure. At some level, the United States stepped away from doing basic infrastructure. If you look at the global you know, lists of you know, the Fortune 500 equivalent of the largest construction companies in the world doing this kind of construction, building power plants, building electricity grids, building ports, building roads, building railroads, who are those companies? You look at that list today, top 20, no American companies. Top 20, first five Chinese companies. Seven out of the top 10 Chinese companies. So again, it is China that has made this huge investment in we're going to be the builders of all of the infrastructure all over the world. And what we're basically saying is the rest of the world needs to get back in the game. They need to be offering an alternative. Countries want an alternative. And so how do we best empower the bank and the fund to support those alternatives? That's what I think is part of the message of this, of this task force report. So for one final question before we end the moderated discussion and move into question and answer, uh, I would like to ask your vision, your view on how ingrained China has become in the international economic system. And more importantly, 
does the U.S. have the ability to uh, challenge or unseat China from this position? And with the BRI in particular, uh, does the Belt and Road uh, Initiative have staying power? So let me start with the second one first, because it's easier, <laughs> but very good questions. Uh, does the BRI have staying power? Yes, yes, and emphatically yes. I mean, part of the staying power is the BRI is now enshrined in the constitution of China. So to get rid of BRI would literally require a constitutional amendment in China. Secondly, it is unequivocally Xi Jinping's, you know, sort of signature foreign policy initiative. And Xi Jinping, as you know, is not going anywhere either. I mean, he's basically um, declared himself the leader of China for as long as he wishes to be so. So so um, neither Xi Jinping nor the Constitution are likely to get changed anytime soon. Um, and more importantly, uh, from my perspective, in terms of responding to your question, elements of BRI have now been sort of ensconced, if you will, in various multilateral institutions. I mean, there have been a whole series of recognitions by parts of the United Nations of specific BRI programs. Uh, China's Health Silk Road, again, specifically read into and adopted, if you will, by, to some degree by the World Health Organization. So China has worked very hard across a whole series, again, uh, these international standard setting organizations, parts of the UN, parts of the WHO, have all now formally embraced and, and, and incorporated, if you will, specific parts of BRI. So it is well and truly making its way into all of the various interstices of, of the international economic order, if you will, um, and the institutions that run the international economic order. Can the United States push China out or unseat China? Um, that's a harder question because, you know, it isn't like a formal seat. You know, it isn't like one place where you say, OK, where are we? Uh, and yet um, it's very clear that in, in, in a, from certain organizations, China is already ahead of the United States. But from a sheer sort of economic power and technology, we are still ahead. Um, if you look at, you know, semiconductor production, we are still sort of two generations ahead of where China is, is right now. And the question for the United States is how do we stay there? How do we stay that one or two generations ahead of China in, in key areas of technology and, and in key areas you know, across the board? And the other thing is some of this is perception. I mean, again, part of this BRI project, we looked at when you ask people in sub-Saharan Africa, who's the most important economic actor in your country? You know, in Kenya, in Tanzania, in, you know, in Indonesia, almost entirely, it's overwhelmingly the answer is China. And yet, if you look at foreign direct investment, how much foreign direct investment is there in Kenya, in Tanzania, in Indonesia, it is heavily American investment, American investment, American companies, they have been there for a lot longer, and they are much bigger in size, but it doesn't feel that way. And so part of the other message, if you will, that's coming out of this is that it is important for the United States to do a little bit better branding on what they're doing and make sure that their companies, which are companies, which are often a subcontractor or a sub subcontractor, um, are, are much more prominent or much more in leadership roles, more importantly, because of the standards that come with that. Um, and that's really where I think there is this sense where the U.S. really has to reassert its leadership is in pressing for high standards agreement, high standards in terms of transparency, environment, economic sustainability. And, and that's where, again, the United States has to really push back is on insisting that if you're going to do BRI, you have to do it right. And what China is doing is not doing it right. Uh, and, and that's where you have to really keep the pressure going. All right, so that concludes the moderated uh, discussion. We will now move into question and answer period. So to start off, uh, we have a question from our VP of operations, uh, Ken Stibler. And uh, he asks what the future of the RMB is uh, with this uh, shift uh, now with COVID-19, but also with China's broader integration within the global economic system. Where does the Chinese currency sit and what is the future of it? Uh, so I, I think the future is only going to be more. Uh, and, and you see, you know, again, China has now uh, 
uh, is now currently testing in a significant number of cities in China in a major way, uh, the rollout of a digital currency. So again, for those of you that follow this, this is not exactly Bitcoin. I mean, some people thought, oh, well, that's kind of cool that China would have the equivalent of Bitcoin. No, this is going to be a digital currency that is still very much linked to the Chinese central bank, um, but it is its way of getting the renminbi uh, again, sort of really much more out there into the world. China is pushing for the renminbi to be um, the currency in more and more and more of its contracts. And you are seeing more and more of these BRI contracts be done in renminbi. So again, China is both lending and expecting payment in renminbi. Um, it, is, it is trying to push renminbi out there. And, and it really, I think, is looking at the digital space, this idea of a digital renminbi as the way that it could leapfrog over everything else, skip all of this other old fashioned banking, bricks and mortar technology, and go straight to digital currency currency and straight to a digital RMB as a way to advance uh, the promotion of the RMB as, you know, as again, at least as powerful or as having uh, more, more power than the dollar. Again, it's a ways off, but by using technology to leapfrog in time, uh, I, I think it's coming sooner than, than many people may realize. The next question comes from uh, Patricia Diaz. And it reads, uh, the RCEP integrates friends and enemies alike. Uh, can we make a distinction between initiatives like the RCEP and BRI? Along this line, should we consider non-BRI projects through a geopolitical lens? So the RCEP, the Regional Cooperative Economic Partnership, you know, was interesting in part because until the RCEP came along, you know, the perception I think of everybody on the task force was that China was really not doing very much through what I would call standard setting kind of agreements across countries. As I mentioned, you know, almost all of these agreements are one-offs, bilaterals with one country. And, and China, again, sort of preferred that because when you're only doing a one-off deal, you have more power if you're China than whoever it is that you're negotiating with. And the other side doesn't know what anybody else is doing. RCEP is a departure, uh, and I think it's important to, to understand it as that. And on the other hand, to understand that it is uh, not a, the sort of earth shattering agreement that many might think. In other words, the, the RCEP is not a free trade agreement in the sense that uh, the countries are not agreeing to get rid of all of their tariffs. So many of them are keeping tariffs on a whole, a whole range of products. So it is not like CPTPP, where the expectation is that everybody that's a part of that, uh, that CPTPP is the agreement uh, started out as the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, that is now Mexico and Canada, not the United States, and a number of the other Chile and the other countries along that side. Again, an agreement uh, with many of the countries in Asia, not China, not, not Korea, but, but Japan and others. So as a contrast, RCEP is a much shallower agreement in, in many ways. It doesn't cover uh, these kind of deep commitments, but what it does do that is very, very important is pull every a lot of the trade into China as the hub. Uh, China is much more the center of. Uh, China is the one that's doing a lot of the importing of parts and exporting of finished goods. China is the one that's sort of orchestrating and managing a lot of the trade around it. And so RCEP is, is you know, very significant in part because of what it means for uh, the degree of cooperation, how, how many and how often do all of these trade ministers get together. RCEP also does something that, again, is important for the United States to understand, which is it creates a rule of origin that says that if any component part of any of this was done in any one of the RCEP countries, so again, that's all of the ASEAN countries, plus Korea, plus uh, Japan, plus China. I mean, that's a big network of countries, plus New Zealand, plus Australia. So you've got a pretty big network there. If you do any part of any of it anywhere in those countries, it's considered an RCEP product, and it trades under whatever preferences there are. So it is very much pushing a regional integration that all these supply chains should stay within that region. And again, that is something that the United States needs to be really worried about, is how much China has now pulled those RCEP countries sort of within its orbit, because it is clearly doing that um, through RCEP. And it's, and it's creating sort of relationships, and it's creating supply chain networks that are going to be very, very hard uh, for the United States to get into um, or to break apart. Our next question comes from 
Frank Milburn, who is an analyst uh, with the UES's research branch, uh, the Economics Research Institute. Uh, it reads, does China have any notable strategies focused around the energy sector to expand its influence abroad? Or do policy banks treat energy projects in Angola, Panama, uh, and the like as mere infrastructure projects? I would say no, no, there's a whole strategic vision around it. And it's sort of interesting looking at what China is doing in this sector. I mean, part of it is, is interesting slash negative from a, from a climate perspective, because if you look at what has happened, China has done in the energy sector, has really used this BR, its, it's sort of model of development. When I say that, what I mean is China brings in technology. And again, sometimes legally, sometimes maybe not legally, but it brings in technology. So among the technologies that China has clearly brought in is solar, wind, geothermal, and hydro, right? It then, in essence, has a closed market within China, a closed but very large market within China. And so it has been able to develop, again, the biggest most efficient, most effective companies in the world to produce solar, wind, geothermal, and hydro. So it's it's got the renewable energy companies that many in the world would aspire to. Um, the problem is then that's not what it's been exporting with respect to the Belt and Road. So it's it's got these big, capable, highly capable renewable energy companies, but it's largely, again, until last year, more than half of all of its power exports were in coal-fired plants. Um, and that's both because it literally was dismantling its old dirty coal-fired plants, literally taking them apart and moving them into a BRI country and reconstructing them. It's also locking in those countries and those plants to buying Chinese coal. China is the largest producer of coal. So again, it's, it's, it's locking in a market for its coal. It's locking in those countries to a carbon intensive you know, future. Those plants are gonna last 30, 35 years on average. So again, we're looking at a long-term problem, but more importantly, China is building electricity grids everywhere. So it's not just that they're building the power plant, they're building the entire grid. They're building the entire transmission systems. They're building the entire grid and grid management. And again, the concern from many countries is China could just turn off the power in various places if it doesn't like a decision that your country has made about, say, what's happening in Taiwan or what's happening in the South China Sea, or you've said something negative about the treatment of Uyghurs. I mean, you see that right now, right now, all of a sudden in China, boycotts of H&M, boycotts of all these companies because they have taken a stand with respect to the Uyghurs. Well, again, the concern is that because China is now the one running and building uh, grids, and again, the single largest company, you know, again, coming out of China, largest, one of the largest countries in the world is the state grid system coming out of China. If you just look at the Fortune 500 company list, um, you know, you see right up there, state grid. Well, that's China's company that is running electricity and running these grids. And the concern is both the power that China then has over the grids, but also the surveillance. Uh, that it gives. If if you can if you can have all of these smart city smart grid systems, how much information are you able to communicate? Um, how much information are you able to get? How much data are you able to get that you can use for your own AI development? So it is both a strategic concern and and you know a concern about about climate and and where we're headed with all the coal fired plants. The next question comes from Elijah Karshner from the Institute for International Economic Policy. Uh, he asks, with regards to the recent uh, Sri Lanka-China uh, port lease, uh, some hawks are saying that uh, BRI lending was designed to acquire control over strategic ports or infrastructure. Do you think this is the case or was this just a convenient way for Sri Lanka to reduce their debt? Uh, what is the likelihood of this happening in the future? So it's an excellent question, I, I, and I think we we address this one very directly in the in the BRI task force report because it is the sort of considered view of everyone on the task force that um, that this is a little bit of a I don't want to say urban myth, but it's a little bit of a misstatement to say that the BRI is you know entirely trying to entrap countries into this kind of debt um, that the 
that the Sri Lankan port situation had a lot of very specific factors connected to that particular port uh, that were a lot more intra Sri Lankan politics, a little bit of corruption, a little bit of a lot of things going going awry such that they ended up uh, having to grant China a 99 year lease, if you will, on on that port. But underlying it is this concern, as I mentioned, you know, this is not like the World Bank that is largely financing projects heavily through grants. All of these Chinese projects are done through fundamentally commercial loans. And what we're finding is, again, in a lot of the debt renegotiations or others, among the things that happens is the loans get collateralized, meaning the countries are going to have to put up something um, as collateral if they're going to try to renegotiate these loans. And often they don't have other readily available things to put up as collateral, so they end up putting up. Um, other pieces of land, other ports, other other things uh, as the collateral for these loans. So the degree of loan collateralization by hard infrastructure slash land slash control over something is yes a significant concern going forward. That's part of the reason why you know again so much emphasis on this need to push China on on doing a better job of renegotiating its loans in a more transparent way. So we have time for one more question. We've received a lot of questions uh, and we apologize for not being able to get to everyone's. Uh, but this one last question reads, uh, you mentioned a shift to focus on digital infrastructure and touched on the surveillance capabilities that go along with that. Can you comment further on the impact of cybersecurity issues in general and actions the US and other countries should take to ensure more balance and security measures in this area. And this one's from Paige. Yeah, so again, no, there's no question that that was a, a significant concern by the task force. And, and again, one of the co-chairs of the task force, Admiral Gary Roughhead, had been you know, the commander of the Pacific Fleet, the commander of the Atlantic Fleet, you know, and very, very aware of uh, the security concerns that arise, again, both from China's access to uh, the physical, I mean, the ports, et cetera, but also, uh, again, a tremendous concern over what happens in terms of how much uh, undersea cable um, is being laid by China and how much of that undersea cable traffic, you know, again, whether or not there is this ability to literally, you know, get into those cables um, and what we need to do. So it, there is a lot in the report, I think, that is talking about what does the United States need to do. Among other things, again, it needs to make sure that it has security over its own undersea cables. It needs to make sure that it's got alternatives. It needs to make sure that it is aware of when, when, where, and how its networks are or could be compromised. It needs to make sure that it has alternative secure lines of communication. But again, it needs to make sure with the hard infrastructure that, um, again, I think the report is pretty clear, there isn't a concern you know, for example, on the ports right now, that every one of these ports that China now owns, runs, or did did the construction of, that they that they can be easily just turned into a military port. So there isn't a concern that this has just opened up, you know, uh, you know, forty six ports in Africa to to Chinese military vessels. Some, but not many. But the concern is again things like the information that you get. If you know every boat that comes in and out and you have the manifest of every container that comes in on every boat in and out, um, you are seeing where people are moving goods and, and people uh, that you can then get intelligence uh, that may, again, work to China's benefit. Uh, and so the concern is on the cyber side, you know, what again, what are they getting and whether they're able to literally steal um, and or what is happening with respect to the security in the cloud. And then on the physical side, it's this connection between the physical and the and the data collection um, and the intelligence gathering that you can do in and around in and around the hard infrastructure. So across the board, you know, again, significant concerns and significant concerns in the in the cybersecurity area. All right, uh, thank you so much, Professor Hillman, uh, for your time uh, and contribution. Uh, I think we all have a much better understanding of China and the BRI and what's been happening more recently. Uh, from COVID-19 to China's own domestic issues. Uh, I, I would like to thank all of you for attending. We'll be sending out the CFR task force report uh, to everyone that was registered, and we highly recommend you read further to gain an even better understanding on, on all of these uh, critical issues. 
so thank you. Uh, and uh, Jennifer, if, if you want to uh, sign us off there. Well, again, I would only say to a huge thank you from me for all of you that have an interest in this. And again, I, I, I encourage you and applaud you to stay engaged um, in the world of economics, uh, in the world of foreign policy. Uh, there's lots of really interesting overlaps there. So thank you for your uh, attention to this issue. Uh, it's not one that's going away. So it's worth one, you know, it's one worth uh, keeping keeping in mind. And again, a real thanks uh, to Evan Enns for putting this together. Uh, it's been a pleasure of mine to get to know Evan and to have a chance to work with him. And so I want to thank him for, for inviting me and for putting this event together. So I wish you all the best of luck as you start to get into that final season. Uh, for those of you that are starting that, that uh, wind up to, to finals and exams and final papers, good luck. Uh, and thank you very much.